In this episode, we are tackling the shield of faith. And when you hear the word shield, you go, oh, I think I know what Paul is talking about. No, you don't. This is absolutely explosive and unbelievably helpful to us as we navigate the challenging aspects of life. So let's dive into part five of Armor of God. Friends, all throughout this mini-series, we've been talking about how to stand firm. This is a phrase that Paul uses multiple times in Ephesians 6. And he's saying when you are experiencing troubles, when you're experiencing hardships, when you're getting attacked, stand firm. And in this episode, we're going to talk about the tactical way Roman soldiers stood firm and what that actually means for us. And just a quick hint, it's Astounding. This is absolutely fantastic what Paul is doing here. Now, as we jump back into the various parts of Roman armor, we've been identifying two different categories. The first three that Paul gives that we've already explored are pieces of armor that you're always supposed to have on. In this episode, we are now dipping into the second category, which are the pieces of armor that you take up when the battle ensues, when the battle is raging. These are the pieces that you take up. And so in Ephesians 6.16, we see this language in addition to all taking up the shield of faith. So we see this taking up of the shield. We'll see to take up the helmet as well as the sword in forthcoming episodes. But notice what, the way that this begins. It says, in addition to all. Now, literally in Greek, it just says in all. And I just want to point that out because some translations actually take this Greek phrase and they put it into the English as above all or above all else take up the shield of faith. And people will look at that and go, oh, it must be that the shield is the most important piece of armor. I don't think that that's what Paul is doing. I don't think that's what the Greek is communicating. That when it just says, in addition to all or in all, it's like, okay, in addition to everything we've already discussed, be sure to take up that shield of faith as the battle ensues. Or you could even say in all, meaning any time that you are being onslaughted, don't forget to take up that shield of faith. I think that's what it is getting to. All of the pieces of armor are important and we're supposed to put on the full armor, not just individual pieces, but the full armor in order to be able to stand firm. So, we come into this taking up of the shield of faith. This word faith that Paul uses is the Greek word pistis. And it's a word that can mean faith, belief, trust, confidence, but it can also mean faithfulness as well as fidelity. Now notice how Paul uses this word pistis in one of the most well-known passages in the entire Bible. We've already looked at it in this series. When Paul writes this in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. There's our word pistis. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So what Paul is declaring here is that we are not saved by good deeds or by works. We're actually saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. But one of the things Paul is not doing here is saying that faith is just some kind of intellectual affirmation of who Jesus is. For Paul, faith leads to a certain type of behavior, i.e. faith. Fullness. This is why this is not the climactic moment here in Ephesians 2. Paul is going somewhere, and after he makes a statement, the very next thing he says in verse 10 is, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to walk out. So for Paul, faith isn't just believing in Jesus Christ and believing who he is. It's saying, okay, if I believe who Jesus is and I'm going to follow Jesus, then there is a certain thing that I'm supposed to do that speaks to the faith that I claim I have. And that's why he says, listen, God has given us things to do. We are called to walk out our faith in faithfulness. 
So it's not just intellectual assent. In fact, for the Greeks, they would say, hey, you can believe something and not necessarily do it. But for the Hebraic mind, what you do is dependent upon what you believe to be true. If you say, hey, I believe this, but you don't live it out, they would say, well, you never believed it in the first place. And so this is why I really like for us to hold in our mind that it's not just the shield of faith, it's the shield of faithfulness. How do we take the faith that we claim we have and live it out faithfully in the world today? I think that's what Paul is getting at. And when you look at all the different ways that he use, uses the word pistis in his letters, he's always talking about how do you use your belief in Jesus get lived out in everyday life? How do you become faithful as a result of the faith that you claim you have in Christ Jesus? And so hold that shield of faithfulness in mind as we unpack the rest of this. Now, Paul links faith with the word shield. And in Greek, it's the word thurion, and it just means shield. It's just a generic Greek word for that. So as we've been exploring in this series, sitting behind all of this is a Roman legionnaire. And so we've been looking at what are all of the pieces of armor that a Roman legionnaire would have. And when it comes to the shield in Latin, it's called the scutum. And this is what a scutum looks like in a modern day reenactment. And it's actually really interesting because there's only been one scutum found in archaeological excavation. And it's actually this one right here. It's from the mid third century AD, so somewhere in the 200s AD. And it was found at Duro Europis, and this is in 1932 it was found. And this is on the eastern side of Syria today. This was an old Roman fort. And so you can see here, this is what has been found. Now, when I show you this image, this and this look very different. And the question becomes, well, why are they depicted like this if this is the only one that has actually been found? Well, it's the only one that's been found in archaeological excavation, but we have ancient Roman writers talking about the scutum, and we also have depictions in reliefs on architecture. So this is the Roman Emperor Trajan. He ruled from 98 to 117 AD, and here in the Forum of Trajan in Rome, we have this enormous column right here called the Trajan Column. It's 125 feet high, and as you get closer to it, you see these reliefs. It's actually, the, the relief itself is over 200 meters long, and it spirals 23 times around the column. It's absolutely astounding. And as we kind of zoom into this upper left-hand side of the image, you can see here, here are scuda. That's the plural of scutum. And these are all of the shields and the orientation and the uh, depiction of these Cl more closely fits this look. This is why this is there, and there are some other examples as well, but this is probably the best one. And so it gives you a little bit of an idea of the actual shield. Now, obviously, you have been seeing throughout this series that we have had a shield in the shot, and um, this is a decorative shield. It's actually just made out of metal. It's relatively lightweight. It's not quite as tall as what uh, an original scutum would have been, but at least gives us a, a good idea of what the shield is like. So an actual Roman scutum uh, is about four feet tall. It's about two and a half feet wide, and it is curved in nature. It's what made this shield very unique. There were lots of different types of shields in the ancient world. There were actually several different types of shields that Roman soldiers would use, but when it came to the Roman legionnaires, it was this shield that the soldiers preferred. 
Uh, it was made out of wood, and it was made with many different pieces of wood, like plywood. So it was pieces of wood glued together in order to get this circular look. Uh, in addition to that, it would actually be outlined in metal because when you stick it on the ground, it's hitting rocks and you want it to hold its integrity. And so it was outlined in metal. And then you have a metal boss here in the middle called the umbo. And in the shot that I showed you earlier of what had been found in archaeological excavation, the umbo wasn't actually found, but you can see the horizontal handle. And now in this depiction of this, again, this is just a decorative shield, is that you can see that it's horizontal and that's actually accurate. Now in the originals, you would have like a piece of wood, a handle, and then this protects your hand, and it's also really great for hitting the enemy. But the reason why it would be horizontal here is because the shields are anywhere from 16 to 20 pounds. They're incredibly heavy. And so when it came to a Roman soldier using the shield, this is not a shield that you easily just swing around. It's a shield that is meant for defensive purposes. And typically what would happen is that the Roman soldiers would get in a position where they would want to put the shields down onto the ground and into the dirt in order to provide leverage as the opposing enemy comes at you. Now, one of the things that also made this really great is because it was rounded like this, it deferred energy of anything that was thrown at you. So if you've just got a flat shield and you get a boulder or not necessarily a boulder, but like a catapulted rock or even an arrow, it hits you, you get the full brunt of that. But if it's curved and it hits on the side, it defers some of that energy so you don't take as much of a hit. Uh, what's more Roman soldiers would do is that even though it was made out of wood and metal, it would also be overlaid in leather. And if you knew that your enemy was going to be firing fire darts or fire arrows at you, and the way that those arrows would work is that you would have a piece of fiber on the end of the arrow dipped in tar and be lit on fire, and opposing enemies would shoot arrows at you, is that Roman soldiers before a battle would actually soak the shield in water in order to prevent any arrows from hitting the shield from actually burning up the wood. In fact, Paul says in here, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. This is what Paul seems to be referring to is what Roman soldiers would do as an extra measure to protect themselves with the shield. And by the way, the Parthians, the arch nemesis of the Romans, they were notorious for fighting with arrows that they would send inflamed to the Roman soldiers. Um, so you've got this Roman shield as the protective measure for the enemy onslaught. Now the question becomes for us, why is Paul using the word pistis, the word faithfulness, in connection to the shield. Well, the shield wasn't just used for individual purposes for Roman soldiers. The shield was used as a way to be combined with other shields in order to be an incredible defensive force against an opposing enemy. And so one of the things that the Roman soldiers would do is they would engage in a formation called testudo here. And testudo means tortoise in Latin, a turtle. It's how you would protect yourselves. And so one of the most important rules among the Roman legions was that you never go off on your own. You always stay together as a unified team. In fact, one of the fascinating things that Roman historians talk about is that when it comes to what the Roman soldiers wore, they had protection all through the front of their body. And as you turn around, that breastplate would go around to their back as well, but they were not allowed to have any protection from their hamstrings to their heels. 
Why? Because they wanted to deter any Roman soldier from turning and fleeing in battle because now they're exposed to the enemy and they didn't want that. They said as long as we stood side by side interlocking our arms and our shields, we would be able to stand firm against the enemy. And so you have the front row here would hold the shields up. And in many cases, what they would do is they would bury them into the ground, lean them back a little bit. And then the soldier, the second row behind you, they would put their hip into your back in order to keep you upright so that as the enemy advanced and hit you, you would be able to stand that force because you have people backing you and keeping you supported from the back and then obviously as you can see in this the second row would put their shields over the top and together you would be like a turtle a unified hole that is going against the enemy and when Paul says take up the shield of faithfulness how do we remain faithful when we are being entrenched in battle, when the enemy is coming at us, when we're going through hard times, the imagery here is you do so in community. That you are never to be isolated or on your own. In this formation, you can withstand it. If you go off on your own, you are a sitting duck. And here's what's so cool about what Paul has been saying all throughout this passage that we've been looking at in this mini-series, is that all of the language that he has used has actually been plural. So we read here, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you, we read that as me individually, singular, but that is actually plural. In the next verse, verse 12, for our struggle, obviously our is plural. Here we go. So that you, that's plural, stand firm, therefore, having belted your waist, that's plural, having strapped on your feet, that's plural, having, in addition to all, take up the shield of faith, which you will be able, this is also plural. See, any time that we get off on our own, we are incredibly vulnerable to attack. And friends, this is exactly what the evil one wants to do to us, to get us alone and to get us isolated. Because when we are away from community, we are most vulnerable. And for many of us, if you were to look at either this image or this image and you were to say, oh man, like that feels more like me than that, then we're in trouble. And so often what the enemy does is that when we're going through difficulties, when we're going through struggles, is that the enemy wants to make you to believe yet yeah, you're the only one who is going through this. Nobody can understand what you are going through. Or to make you feel so ashamed about what you are going through that you don't let anyone else in on what you are actually battling. And you find yourself alone, isolated, nobody knows, and you're vulnerable. And what Paul is saying is that when we are under attack, we cannot be a lone ranger left unprotected in the middle of nowhere. Paul is saying we need a band of brothers and sisters to link arms with and to go into this testudo battle formation so that we will be able to stand firm in the midst of battle. And so here's just the question I want to leave you with in this episode is, who are you linking arms with when things get difficult? Who are your people? Who, who, who are the people that you call in the middle of the night when you are struggling? Who are the ones that you stand with when you're going through a tough time? And who are you on the lookout for that you stand with when they're going through a difficult time? 
Because I would imagine that the truth of all of this is resonating with us. That when you think about your own story or maybe someone else's story, when they were going through a difficult time, whether it was a tragedy, uh, whether it was a, a divorce, maybe it was a lost job, uh, maybe it was an addiction, uh, maybe it was something else, and they were just in pain and struggling, and then you saw people come around them and just said, hey, we're with you. We're going to walk with you. We're going to stand with you. We've got your back. We've got your front. <laughs> We've got either side. We are with you. That is how people get through tough times. They don't get through on their own. They get through in community. And so whatever you may be struggling with, whatever you may be battling with, do not let the enemy believe, make you believe that you are alone, that nobody cares, that you don't need community, that nobody needs to know about it. Those are lies from the pit of hell and they will sink you. You cannot stand firm if you aren't standing alongside of other people and being connected to God. So friends, there you go. Take up the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faithfulness because that is how we live faithful when the battle is raging. So as always, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for listening. And may you walk out the text well in your life.